Uh, my name is Terry Woolweber. I'm a third generation plasterer. Um, I have two great uncles that were plasterers in Cincinnati and in Lawrenceburg. And um, after the 37 flood, dad started working for them. And um, then he got drafted, went to overseas, uh, Battle of the Bulge, Sardines, was under General Patton. And you can imagine how it was working for him. Uh, my dad, that is. Uh, didn't tolerate a whole lot. It was black and white. This is the way it is. Do it. And um, probably the biggest thing, you know, doing a house, you know, I'd say it's just a closet. He said, it doesn't matter. They're paying for that. Do it like you would a room. Um, a cornice. Working on a cornice, you know, you're five feet from it, working on it, a couple feet. He said, make it look, if it looks good here, it'll look damn good on the floor. So that's kind of how I was taught. Uh, Dad started his business in 72. When he come back from the service, one uncle went to Chicago and one went to uh, Florida. Um, he worked for a couple of old German plasters. It was around home. I'm from southeast Indiana. And from around home, there's plasters everywhere. I mean, it wasn't drywallers back in the 40s, 50s. So um, after that, um, I started with him and just kept progressing. I've never done a drywall finish in my life. Dad done one kitchen one time. Didn't like it, so he'd never do it again, and he didn't. And I figured if they do away with plaster, because plaster material is hard to find, that I'll become a Walmart greeter, I guess. <laughs> but I'm not, I don't know that I'm that friendly. But <laughs> Anyway, um, I understand a lot of you are homeowners. Is that true? Or head of a uh, historic districts or just wanting to, to get more knowledge. I'll show you exactly how I was taught. Um, not saying it's the right way, it's the wrong way, but it's the way I was taught. I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of great places. Um, <clears throat> I do travel. I've worked at uh, Louisville. I worked on Henry Ford Mansion in the billiard room. I worked on the Edsel Mansion in Gross Point. Um, and the, the stand on the scaffold in the billiard room in Henry Ford Mansion and just sat there and looked down over that billiard room and thinking, Henry Ford would walk around in here, the Firestone Brothers, Thomas Edison, some of the greatest people that's built America. I was working on their house. So it's not only a job to us as craftspeople, um, it's something that we're leaving to the next generation, is the way we all look at it. Uh, downstairs, there's some really good craftspeople. Um, and they're all willing to talk to you. So just ask any kind of questions you want. I'll get started here. Do I have any questions so far? The biggest problem with decorative plaster and plaster in general is it keeps um, the trade got diminished for quite a few years. Um, and downstairs, I've got examples from when you do a cornice years ago, you would do the straight run and then you can apply all the enrichments. And then at the turn of the century, and this was uh, 19, no, this is 1894, you can see they started doing factories. Decorator Supply, Jacobson, there's a lot of them. And they started making a lot of this stuff in the factory. And then they put a lot of fiber in it and ship it out. So it took a lot of the plasters out of the field that would actually do the work. Because then, when you got a cornice, 
that all the decoration was on, and all you had to do was four foot pieces stuck it up there in a wall or in the ceiling. Carpenters could do that. They would nail it on, um, and then they would just take and caulk the joints. And then I went to a tin ceiling, the tin corners all the way around, and the decorative tin ceiling. And then it went to a styrofoam. And I've got examples of everything downstairs. Now, styrofoam has got its place. Vegas, where they remodel every five years. I mean, you've got a nice big cornice up there to tear it down and, and start over. I'll let you read this. I don't know how quick you can read. Yes, ma'am. You guys can interrupt me anytime and ask me any questions you like. Okay? Now, again, this was 1908. Now, imagine going all the way up to now. Um, I will start with this. This is New Albany. Uh, in the 70s, there was talk of tearing it down and putting a gas station on this corner. And the, the New Albany town saved it. They formed a little nonprofit. They saved it. Now it's a state historic site. It's a beautiful home. Uh, this is where, this is one of the projects. Uh, this was a, uh, oh, it was 30 foot wide, maybe 60 foot long, and up above it was two bedrooms. Well, the American Legion had it for some time in the 60s. Well, at least they didn't tear it down, you know, in the 70s, but they had torn out a wall on the second floor and made it a dance hall. Well, you know, we got a, it's all okay. At least they didn't tear it down. But uh, so that ceiling lost its support on the top. So now, can you imagine dancing? How happy everybody was in the early '60s, at least. <laughs> Maybe the late '60s, they weren't so happy. But uh, anyway, that ceiling had a lot of cracks, a lot of deflection in it, and on each. There's two fireplaces in this room, two six-foot medallions. So the ceiling is pretty cracked. It was it was uh, repainted. I touched up in the '60s, I believe. And so, being a state historic site, they've got a lot of visitors in there. So we come up with a plan to veneer, encapsulate the original ceiling by putting a veneer plaster on. So we did hang board over it. And then we went back over and I put all the decorations back up. So this is all, this is a big rope molded on the ceiling with baskets. It's got a wreath in the corner with birds. And you can see what the color was. It was pretty drab looking. <clears throat> so one of the first things you want to do when you start a project like this is you want to do a paint analysis on it. You want to get the decorative paint, the colors, um, all the stencils that you need off of it, the cornice, take all the colors off of that. And that's what this is. And you guys are all welcome to look at this. This was done by Matthew Moss in Baltimore, which he's, I think he's getting close to retirement. 
But it's basically a, uh, it shows you all the different colors and found out that this is not this place, this is the hill forest. But uh, it, it goes into a lot of detail. And that's one of the first things you want to get done on any. Maybe you're not going to replace the gold leaf, but if you can do it and get somebody to do it for you, that way you have a documentation for maybe the next owner wants to put it back the way it was. So that's basically what this is. They take and clean all the grime and dirt and get down to the original color. And the same thing, this is a close-up of the corners. We can see here where they, they took the paint off, and sometimes it's hard to get off. Again, if you have any questions, please stop me and ask. And this is all the different uh, designs that they had on this big cornice. Now this here was a piece of wood, this trim right here. And we surmised it was put on there because they had wallpapered the wall at some point. And they didn't want a wallpaper up on all these. So they put this wood trim on, which it was decorative, but it had a straight bottom on it. So when we took a piece off, we seen it was all finished nails, round nails. So we knew it wasn't original of the house. But they did keep it because it was an addition at some point. So you can see all the, the different layers of decoration on this. Now minus this. What do I do? You can't touch it. Oh. That's, why I, that's why I have a flute. <laughs> Uh, 70, 1878, I believe. I have uh, some pamphlets down on my table. Actually, it's a state, yeah, it's a state of stories. I, I believe it's 78, something like that. Oh, 1867. 67. Okay. okay. See, I should know that. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, that's a good question. On the ceiling, this big cornice, say you, you have a cornice here, and this is kind of tough to do because I don't want to drag all my stuff up here. And it's all downstairs, so I'll, I can show you downstairs easier. But basically, it would be uh, framed down similar to this bulkhead here, but not that deep. They'd frame it down with wood lath, and then we'd put sand mud on that, which is the, the base coat. And then a lot of times they would take my big nausea downstairs. I was going to bring one of those up and I didn't. Um, they would take the knife, the straight, the straight runs, and you take that knife and you put, and you'll be able to see that a little, uh, a little bit farther along. I thought I brought one picture, but I didn't. Um, <clears throat> then that would all be attached there. So it all starts at the beginning. With, it's wood lath, just like the ceiling would be wood lath. It's all framed out wood lath. Kind of, it kind of makes that design that comes out. And then we put sand mud on that, and then you go over with the the lime and mold it. Okay. And then all your small pieces, that's just your straight runs, and all your enrichments are stuck on the molding plaster. These are curves and they're just kind of sitting in there. It's kind of hollow in the back. And they made all that to give it like a 3D look. And also another reason they say, so the cold soap would settle back in there, in, in the crevices, and not on the face of it. That's, whether that's true, that's one theory. But yes, it was, uh, Am I going the wrong direction? No. Okay. This this is where it is. <clears throat> we set up scaffold on the whole thing, put a tray around, and we put all had to take all this down, and we laid in the tray all the way around. Now, as you can see, this this is pretty flat on the wall, and then this is the corner is uh, the corner up top right through here.
Okay? All this decoration <coughs> on the ceiling is just stuff with molding plaster. And I can show you, I think, a better picture. No, that's taking down the Okay, there's you see this big white spot here, and there's there's a whole little layer on. And what they would do, they cut through the sand mud, they cut a little thing up to the wood lath, fill out with mold, wet molding plaster, and you butter the back of your piece and you stick it up there. That's the only thing held it up. Same way with this medallion. This is a several piece medallion. I take it down, I measure everything, take pictures of it so I can see if it's crooked or how it's put up. Again, I measure how far out from the gas pipe was. And there's the pieces, that's half of it down. I number all the pieces where it goes west, east, whatever. Um, <clears throat> now, medallion like this, you go to left and the right, this is a piece right here. This is a piece, it's a left and a right. You've got a shield here, there'd be four of these, usually around. And you've got the two ends. They're not huge pieces back then. Um, the repeating patterns, like the egg and dart, were basically 10 inch pieces. And then they would just repeat it around. If it happened to go down a curve, you didn't make a curve, you just broke it. They just pushed them back and broke, broke them, and then they touch up the cracks. That's where they put up the rhythm. Right here, you see that? That big hole right here to the wood lath. Then they would take wet mud and it key up to the wood lath, and then six to the back of your plastic piece. Okay, when you take these down, you can see it didn't come in this many pieces. So it broke in all these pieces to get it down. So I got to put that back together. Same way with the, the basket. Apparently there were eight. Might have been more than that. When you're removing these pieces, are you carefully trying to get off the wall or do you have to soften it? What do you No, I'm trying to get it off. Yeah. Remember that big hole? Yeah. The, the rest of it's all surface. You gotta find a big hole where they attach it. Mm -hmm. And I get a flat saw up there and I just cut off that. And then the rest of it, you can't really pry because you go to pry and bust. Yeah. So you gotta take them off easy. If you're, um, I got a call from Cincinnati. I went, I don't remember where it was, Walnut Hills or somewhere. They were tearing down some mansions. It was a reuse uh, place. It was, got the salvage rights. So I bought all the medallions out of the house. But see, they were tearing down houses, which I hate that because it was a nice big Victorian. And they tore it down to build a condo. But yeah, they wouldn't went in and salvage the fireplaces, the windows, and everything. It all went to dumpster. So I went out. I got 16 medallions out of two different places, and right across the street from one another. Huge medallions. So I don't advertise those on eBay, I, just for my clients. So I can reproduce those, and I can put a copy of that. Uh, it's very. It's a. Uh, I'm a big Victorian. I like Victorian era, that uh, late 1800s. But uh, that's how you get them down there. I just took a sawzall and I cut them. I took a wood lath and all down there because they just turned out now. Uh, this is a, a piece, and usually I to get to detail, and I got some examples downstairs, to get to detail. It's got so much paint on it, a hundred some years of paint. So I take picks and I pick it off to get the paint off. So you can pour it, because if I made a mold with this, I would just, I wouldn't have the detail. And you can see these little ribs in the leaves, you lose all that. So now I make a mold with this and I've got that original crisp look to it. 
because the vacuum, if I made a mold of that, and then you paint it one time, you won't have nothing. It just looks like a big bunch of cotton material. Okay, this ceiling, I told you we encapsulated the ceiling. Uh, this is board. It's imperial board. It's much like drywall board, except it's got a different paper on the front. It's more porous to absorb moisture. Um, and while I'm talking about board, this is a piece of the first board ever made. This was <laughs> second board. It was made in 1896, I believe, 1894. Uh, Sackett invented this while they started inventing board, and they used straw and tar. Well, I'd pretty fine. So that didn't work well. So he came up with this slurry, and it was paper, and then they uh, slurry, Jensen slurry, and then paper, and he done it like that. Um, USG bought him out right at the turn of the century, United States Jimson. And uh, they're one of the big, biggest leaders in board. You're welcome to look at that, come up and look at it, whatever. So anyway, this big ceiling and this big ceiling, you need to have some kind of expansion so it don't break or crack. Two far places, stone building or a brick building, masonry building, and it's, it has uh, 15 foot ceilings on the first floor, 17 on the second, 10 on the third, and an 8 foot basement. The doors are 12 foot tall. So you can imagine when you're down there right across from Louisville and the sun shining on that building in August, it's got to be 150 on the outside of the building. And now everybody's got to have everything air conditioned. On the inside, it's air conditioned. So somewhere that wall, everything's got to move. So we was trying to alleviate as much as we can the cracks. So basically from the, the wall here, from the fireplace, it'd come out and the crack would stop the expansion joint. So we didn't want the expansion joint to be seen. So we hid it, basically. So it looks like a shadow. This was out in the middle of the ceiling. Okay, now this is where I told you we make to make molds. These are the pieces. Now these were pretty, these hadn't been painted in a while. And they were going to go back up and put all the original. We were shooting for about 90% of the original to go back up. I didn't put one, I think there was one piece on a medallion that I made a mold of and put back up. The rest of it, we all put all the original back up. Now this is a mold box. And basically you lay this piece on a piece of three quarter inch plywood. You build walls on it, like a dam, all the way around it. Okay? You take that, this is clay all the way around it. And you fill so the, the rubber don't go out, because it's real thin. It's thinner than a quart of oil, you know, 30 weight oil. <clears throat> then we take Murphy's oil soap and we paint all wood. We paint this piece so the rubber don't stick to it. And then right before I pour the rubber in there, I take, they have a, a release called, called PolyEase that's sold by the company that sells the rubber. Well, that's expensive for a little can, so I get a can of paint. It does the same thing. So I spray it with Pam, and then it's a two-part rubber. This is preparing everything. You got to seal it all the way around. This is pierced. It's got holes in it. So this is a one-piece mold. I just pour over the top. I flip it over, take, the, take it out, and I can pour it right there. That's what I got. This is pierced, so this is a two-piece mold. So I do it this side. I got the, all these little holes packed in clay, like this. You can see the clay here. All these little holes will be packed in clay, up about halfway or three-quarters in that hole from the back. 
you make sure you seal it good so the rubber don't get down through there. Okay, there's my pan and my Murphy's Oil soap. That's how I get my rubber in two five gallon buckets. That two buckets right now is pushing $800. This is a 40 pound kit. It's 40 pounds in each one. Part A, Part B. I use 7430. If you want, they got small buckets of it. You can get it. You can get it to test just a little bit to test it. Uh, but the company is Polytech out of Pennsylvania. And you can go online and see everything about it. So there's after I pour them. Uh, 24 hours you can demold it. So you pour the whole thing full of the rubber mixture? Only about just over top. Oh. Just over, you don't want it too full. Okay. Because it's too hard to get it out. Okay. So you get a quarter, half inch above your highest point, and that's where you want to cut her off. Not only is it hard to get out, but it's costly. Mm -hmm. So you try to save as much rubber as you can. See, this is the back of it. And um, this is where I'm getting ready to put it back up. But all these holes here has to be there. So that's where you get your two-piece mold. You got to one side, you flip it over, I take all the clay off the back of it. And then I got rubber sticking up through all these holes and through here. So then I do it again. Pour rubber on the back. Then I take it apart, it's a two-piece mold. Then I cut holes, cut holes in the rubber mold, and that's where you pour holes. And here we're putting it back up. You can see a lot of white. Stick it all up with molding plaster. Don't have the bird in that one yet. Now, I told you about the expansion joint. The expansion joint's right. I put this right on the edge of that so from the back it looks like a shadow. So you can't see the expansion joint at all. Because normally the expansion joint go across the middle of the ceiling. And the construction manager and myself decided that we didn't want to see it. So there's a medallion going back up. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Almost, you have 30 minutes left. Okay. This is the ceiling after it's done. That's the bay. This had, uh, I think this ceiling was gold leaf. It had copper, bronze, and silver powder on all the different uh, elements of the cornice. And that's before and after. That's the center of the ceiling. Now, now this, the only thing I did here is just a plaster the ceiling, flat. The decorative painter done all this. It's just beautiful. I mean. So you put Put uh, quarter inch drywall or whatever it is. Half inch, half inch imperial board. And then um, you plaster. Then I, then I put a veneer plaster. Yeah, and then they paint it. Then they paint it on top of that. Wow. Gave them a brand new canvas to paint on. Now, the veneer plaster, the half inch board, and the thin base coat, it's imperial base coat, it's called. It's only a 16, the base coat. That took the place of the old sand mud that was three quarter inches thick. So it's a lot lighter than the old sand mud is. Now, the problem with that in a new house, or in your old house, if you tear off the wood lath, and all you've got your your ceiling joists, more than likely, if you hung board directly on that, it's going to be like this. Because when you plastered it years ago, the lathers would shim down some of that rough cut lumber. Okay, and put the wood lath on. Then the plaster is supposed to go both ways with rods. You know, you basically screen it off like you would seam it. So you take these rods and you go across the joist. You know, so your joist is going this way. So you run it this way to try to get it so you eliminate all this. Because when you do a cornice, if your ceiling goes up and down, your big knife runs on the ceiling and a rail on the wall. So as your ceiling goes down, it comes out from the wall. And if it goes up, 
it goes in tighter to the wall. So when you get all finished, your corn looks like a snake down the side. So that's why you've got to have a, a straight wall and a straight seal. Okay, that's after it's back up. That's, uh, I think it's six, seven foot medallion. It's a pretty good size. And you can see, you can see all the different, uh, the gold and silver. And, I mean, it's so eye popping. And this was High Victorian before High Victorian was even in. He made a lot of trips to Europe. And uh, so he was on the cutting edge. Now this is upstairs where they tore out that bedroom wall. So I'm replacing the cornice. And here, your question back here about how they got it to the tax. Now this gray right here, that's where you core it out. That's what I did here. This is metal lath. I put metal lath in. They didn't have metal lath back when this was made. They used wood lath. But I put, I used metal lath and I made so it drops down and, and tries to grab some of this that's hanging. And um, then after I core it all out, then I come back over. You can see it's about a half inch. Touch the screen again. It's about a half inch there. It's just got the finish on. There's my knife I used. That was downstairs. So I got my rail on the wall. And the only reason I have a rail on the ceiling is so I don't have to hold it. This, this is back. This is back probably an inch from the from where it needs to be. This top rail. It's just so I can. I take it out the end and I carry it back around and put it back in. But then it can set there a while until I get ready to push and push through it. Now, a cornice this big, it takes, oh, probably, I've done eight foot runs, I think, or six foot runs on this big one. I could probably get three runs done in a day. So it's, it takes a while to get it, to get it all through. But this is the way it was done. Um, I made this knife. I got one downstairs that my dad made for Hanover College. You all know where that is. And then you, I got to tell you this. It was a question on Jeopardy. <laughs> Where's the only place in Ohio River you can see three turns of the river, three bends in the river? I just told you. Hanover College. The point of Hanover College. Oh, I don't watch Jeopardy. <laughs> I found out how dumb it was when I watched Jeopardy. Uh, this is a finished cornice. Now you do, I remember when I was getting heavy into cornice work, because when I started, cornice work was going out the window. 70s, dropping ceilings. We'd done houses with seven foot ceilings in them because of the energy crisis in the 70s. You know, gas was so high. So they were these big mansions, no I wanted them. And they was cutting them up to a bunch of apartments, putting the drop ceilings in. Very seldom did you do much work. So, 90s is when I really got back into the ornamental part. We've done some touch up on houses and stuff like that, but to do a lot of it. So, anyway, this, these mitered corners, your knife would only go so far to a corner. You know, you can only start so far out, and then you can only get so close to it. So, I told Dad, I said, I looked in this book. And I found this way to do these corners. It's a, it's a knife with a hinge on it. And you can go to that corner and then it turns and you can go to this. But yeah, he said, try that. He said, that's in a book. Just remember that. He said, the guy that wrote that book probably didn't do it. So, but it didn't work. But anyway, uh, Dad always told me to take two guys a day to mire this corner in. I mean, it's a... The bottom is a little closer than the top. Go ahead. Excuse me, can I ask a real basic question? If you go back one slide, the way that knife works, so you've got your face, and then you put plaster on there, and that knife just kind of goes along. Screens it right off. Screens yeah. it off, gotcha. But it takes several passes. Okay. And I, I normally, I bring something that you guys can run on. 
a little bit just to show you what it's like. And I have everything I need, but it's it's messy. So that, that, keeps, that keeps it all, the contours and everything. Right. So you just kind of go along with it. Okay. Yeah. But the trouble being, once it starts setting, you can't get the knife to it. It heats up and swells just a little bit, so you've got to get with it. Normally it takes three people. You've got a, somebody to run the knife, somebody makes it on the board, and a stuffer. And, I mean, this cornice is about this big, so it's a pretty good sized cornice. And you've got all these different details. So it takes, I mean, you're taking and you're throwing mud in there as fast as you can and you get it cut down quick. Now my uncle, my one uncle I told you about worked in Cincinnati, he lost his eye. They were doing a big church it was toward the end of the day. And they were doing a big cornice and he got a big slobber of lime and moly in his eye. And by the time, all he had was dirty water up there and he got as much as he could out. And by the time he got down and burned his eye so bad, he lost his eyesight. Um, now, there, again, in a book, it said your partner would, if you didn't have any clean water, your partner would lick it out of your eye. Again, that's something in a book, so I don't know. You, there's a lot of things in the books. So anyway, I told Dad, he was, you know, he must have been, uh, milk in the clock, but it does. It takes two guys about a day to do that. This is Emmanuel Baptist Church in Louisville. I worked on this about a year and a half. Uh, a lot of water damage. It's a 55 foot dome. You can see the water damage here. Uh, it leaks so bad. Uh, this is a 48 foot arch. There's four of them in this church. It leaks so bad they put the congregation in the center and they had buckets sitting everywhere, and they finally condemned the church. So this new uh, congregation bought it. Now it's Emmanuel Baptist. Martin Luther King spoke at this church. It's down on 4th and Breckenridge in Louisville. <clears throat> you can see how bad it was, and it wasn't nothing too bad from the stained glass windows up. It was all down below. And I'll go through this quicker. So it's 12 and 6. Um, but all this was, it's all uh, metal construction. All I-beams. It's called, uh, like, it's like rebar, but it's called slick rod. It's about as big as your little finger. And you tie wire it on your cross members. And you do the same thing. It's no different than, than working on a, a house decoration, except it's bigger. The rosettes were about this big around. And I had to crawl up in this because I was responsible if anything fell. So we tried to keep everything we could. So there's the slick rod and the metal latch. You can see it's gone. So I'd go behind places and once I got everything off that was really bad, I got up behind the walls, and some places the plaster was good, but the metal lath was pretty well rotted away. But everything was still holding good. So I went behind it and put new metal lath on and attached it all a little better. There's hang all the lath. Um, and this is a big cornice ledge. I mean, this is all pretty good sized. This was all shipped, like I was telling you, at the turn of the century. They could buy all this out of power like this. Um, you could get anything you wanted out of it. I will tell you, the decorator supply is still in business. So you can still buy stuff out of there. <laughs> but it, they're still in business. So you still can buy, but they had complete ceiling, uh, the whole ceiling is. They're in here, you look at them. But you can buy the whole ceiling. The medallion, the runs around the outside and everything. So this is the sand mud I was telling you about. 
It's basically a plaster base and mason sand. It's all USG material, United States Gemstone material. And uh, I do put some Structolite in it, because Structolite is light. That's what it says, it's light. And it's got perlite in it, which is, it's kind of, takes up a lot of room, and it's lighter. Now, Structolite's the only thing you can get at one of these big box stores, like right? uh, Home Depot or Lowe's. And you, get, you can get some metal lathic, but you can't get none of the rest of it. Okay, that's after it's, uh, I think I got to finish on that. I can't see it on the side here. But it's just like doing a house. And there, I've got it all done. Now this looks like small pads, but that's probably 10 foot tall right there. So it's a pretty good sized area, and that's all curved. So this was a plaster band through here. It's hard to see. All that was raised plaster band. And so I made my knife so it could go around that curve. Okay, there you can see it there a little better. So you fabricate your own knives yes. a lot? Yes. Well, I, yeah, whatever this is, I just uh, make a, the, the profile of it. And then I'll make my own knives like I did downstairs, or you can look at downstairs. Okay, that's that's how far the corner sticks out here. I had to rebuild all that metal lath again. I did have uh, fluorescent lights all the way around that to sit on that. I don't know how they got up there to change the bulb, but apparently they didn't because they were all burnt out, <laughs> broke bird nests on them. So that's still going down. Very elaborate church. This cornice here is pretty good sized. And even though it was all shipped, the cornice was run in place. The straight runs, all the decoration was shipped in. So I guess it was uh, early 1900s. This was built. So that was in the crossover. They were still doing stuff. Uh, still had plasters on the job doing a lot of this. The decorative part. But all the big pieces were shipped. Okay, and this is the scaffold on top of the scaffold. So I'm at the balcony where they made a big platform. And then I rolled the scaffold around on top of it. That's 5, 10, no, that's 13, 19 and a half. That's probably 20 some feet right there. Okay, that's a finished. And the thing is, you'll find out if you ever do a cornice anywhere you make a knife in a room this big, you'll probably find out that you'll make a knife over there and it'll fit over here. So two walls that will fit on the other two walls, they probably had another knife and another crew. And these guys will go from here to there, and those guys will go from there to there. And the knives are just a little bit different. It don't take much, you know, an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch. And it's just been, you blend them all in at the, at the miters and you can't tell. There's a St. Michael's down in Madison. I've done some corn there. From the floor, it looked, you know, you get up very close to it, goes, <laughs> go then it's all over the place. But that's the way it was originally. Plaster is pretty forgiving. You can cut it with a saw. You can, you know, you can carve on it. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. These egg and darts are about this big. So, trouble than it was. <laughs> it was, we had what we call joint knives or minor knives and all it is is a, a piece of steel that's about four inches wide 
and it goes to a point, and they come in six inches up to 24 inches, it's good speed. And you just take that, and you throw wet mud in there, and you just cut it each stage, each side, and you form it all the way up to the top. And that's how you mine in the corner. Or outside the corner is the same way. Okay, then that's a new piece. It goes in with the old ones. And whenever I'm doing something like this, I try to save as much as I can of the original. I mean, you don't want to just take it down because it's easier. Because a lot of times it is easier to make a new piece than it is to, to clean it. Okay, it's the same thing where I'm making molds and Yes, the cupboards you mentioned that I showed for earlier. For historical purposes. Yes, so if something happens to the house, mm -hmm. if it would burn down, yeah. I've got all the molds. It's a gentleman's agreement between yeah. the cupboards and the state of Indiana and myself that I don't use those unless it's a naked dart, a naked dart set But anything that's just specific to that house, like a medallion, I won't use that anywhere else. If it's a leaf, a canthus leaf, there's tons of those. Yes, but I won't use it in the same, exact same. Because yeah. all the medallions that's down there, I haven't seen anywhere else. So. So, another question. So those medallions that, the, that were used, were those shipped, do you think, or in the house? No, okay, I think they so were poured on site. So somebody... So they got the what? molds. They carved, they carved... A lot of times they would make... <coughs> the architects would have the design they want. Yeah. Um, that time period. And they would get the wooden molds. Okay. Or they'd make them out of uh, plaster. And then they would pour. The first one they'd take out, they'd put back. Because that was the most crisp. And then after that... Uh, they would continue to make them, and a lot of times the architects would ask it to be broken so it couldn't be used on another house because you know it's plastic. We're scoundrels. So, if you're interviewing a plaster yes. for a project, what questions would you ask to evaluate their competency for the entire of the work? Uh, ask him how much, uh, ask him if he sands it. Sands it. Because you don't sand plaster. Now I'll tell you, because they've got things so muddy now, drywall and plaster, drywallers are sanding their plasters and they're using drywall mud. So if they sand, then they're not doing traditional plaster. No, but you're, when you use, um, you're at a port of cement, but you're, but you're, you're isn't that what structural light is? No. Okay. No, it's a different. Okay. Structural light is a lightweight, it's a Jimson plaster. Same as the plaster base. It's a Jimson plaster. Now we did use for stucco on the outside. We did use brick cement and sand. Yeah. You know, it's, it wasn't really lime stucco. It was the more modern stucco. I haven't stuck with it in years, but I'd rather not. Two minute uh, the environment with the heat and the wind and all that stuff all makes it, but. That's one thing I'd ask him. Uh, how much dust will be from sanding? You can bait him a little because you really you don't sand plaster, it scratches it. The other thing is just ask him what kind of material he uses. Educate yourself. You can go online. Uh, some of those videos on YouTube is way out there. But uh, there's just ask him what kind of material he uses, how long he's been doing it, give him some jobs he's done. Um, the material is a big thing. And for any of you that's working in your house and you want to patch a crack, first of all, if you've got an old house, it's going to crack. New houses crack. So you've got to learn to live with the crack now. Sometimes, you know, expansion contraction and settlement. <clears throat> the worst thing you do with the crack is take and tape it over the top <clears throat> and 
feather it out or draw it into the town. Or say you do the mixed pumps and chapters in the wall. Outside walls, masonry walls, the heat and cool, any kind of moisture, kind of makes that drywall on that go. Years ago, we used to take a bottle opener, you know, with a pointy part of the bar bottle opener, take it in cracks, and we'd rip a big, that was my job a long time, you know, go and, and when we go back, we'd find out instead of one crack, it'd be two each side of that. So I quit doing that. So what do you do now? What I, do you do? Anything that's loose, you know, it's, uh, peeling off or uh, crunching off. You see if it's loose. Go on each side of the crack and push. If it's wood lath and it gets a lot of give, take some plaster washers and just go in a little ways and make a little indentation in your finish. Get that finish off there. And a plaster washer is just small and you, it's got a little indent in it. And you can put a drywall screw in it. Grab the wood lath if you can, and just pull that in, and do it in three or four places about this far apart. Don't crunch this one all the way in. Take it, snug it up, and go to the next one, put it in, snug it up, because if you push it too quick, it will just break off. So do them slow, and then when you get all that done, it's good and secure, take a little spray bottle of water, spray that crack in. It ain't gonna hurt it. You spray it good and then take the best thing you use, a little bit of molding plaster. Plaster of Paris goes to the same thing. And a little bit of lime. You can get lime at some of the bigger places in Cincinnati here. Um, try not to build the material. There's a couple of places. Um, then after you do that, you can take a putty knife and just take that, mix a little bit of the molding and lime together in like a little batter and then you go set quick. So you take and just push it in that crack and scrape it off. Spritz with a little water and scrape it off. What does the lime do? The lime makes it more pliable. Um, that's when I do a cornice in situ, you use lime and molding to run. It runs a lot easier. When you do it on a bench, bench run, you use straight molding. It's harder to run on a bench to get it. It's easier, but it's harder. That makes sense. Because if you put a lot of line with that, or you core it out, you'll break it from the good maneuver. Okay, that's you can see how the water over the years just ate up. It eats that up pretty bad. Am I running out of time? Ten minutes. Okay, I'll get through this. And we can go downstairs. So that's the finished product there. It took about, like I said, a year and a half to do all this. And uh, a high lead level. Because yeah. all this was a lot of... Lead level? Yeah, wait, how, do you have to, do you have to remove that ball first? Or? Well, no, I just worked and it got pretty high and I quit for a couple weeks, went to another job, and then it come down. About any of us have worked, you know, stained glass, plaster in these old buildings, old paint full of seventies has got lead. That's why it was such good paint. Yes, I mean, and it was hot in August. It's hard to wear respirators and all that stuff. So, so that's that's all the decoration. This is all made out of plaster, and so that's common. You just you got you have to work up the stuff, and to make it look like it it was never touched is your main main goal. You can see here where they start testing the paint, what color paint they're going to use. Um, these, this is all assembled. You got your, your your straight runs. You run with a knife here. These were run on the bench and applied. All the cross members, and then your egg and dart was applied, and then your medallion in the center was applied. Well, now you can go to a catalog like that, and you can buy this whole section, and you just stick it up. It's 
It's got all the decoration on the inside. It's got the medallion. It's just a call for the section to put up. So here's the pieces I'm going to run. So I've got to find out, I've got to have something to run both sides on, a rail. So I had to kind of fur these down so I'd get even all the way through. And this is where I, I run on. And this is one thing I did. I went to Home Depot or Lowe's, one of those. And I got that, it's like plastic, it's like plastic trim. It's square, it's real. Bend real easy. So I used that to run my knife on. It worked very well. And that's what this is right here. That's why I run my knife on. And this is a tough one. Um, and downstairs I have two knives that after they've done this church, they threw it behind the wall. The knives. So I got two of those downstairs to show how they were done in 1900. Oh. And it's the same when we do it now. Okay. It's just more pictures. I mean, this this big crest here is wow, probably this big around. It's kind of hard to see on this how big anything is. But you can imagine the top of this dome is 55 foot, so. It's a pretty good ways up there. This is a, they got a great congregation, uh, over a thousand on their congregation. And uh, this is a big decoration. I think this is three foot or so. Um, and that's a rubber mold I made of it. I like the block molds. Uh, a brush on is a little cheaper, but the brush on won't last as long as the block molds. I mean, they'll last a good while, but even storing them, they seem to get harder, basically. So now they got stuff you can spray on them and bring them back. This is the cross pieces I made on the I bench run these. I put the slick rod across, and then you, you fasten them with uh, uh, molding. But I took a tie wire and hooked them up top because I'm responsible for falling and hit somebody at 48 feet. So there's some pieces in there. I'm hurrying here. Okay, that's just one of the panels. Again, it's all done by hand. That's one of these panels here. Now this Real quick story, we was finishing up on this one corner over here. I was up on the scaffold pretty high. They said it was going to have a few volunteers come in to go over stuff. Well, I kept getting this is a picture I took when I was up on the scaffold. They said a couple of volunteers. Well, they told me to keep working. We've got to get this done. You know? I said, okay. I'll be like a fly on the wall. So I've always got a tape measure on my belt. I'm up there and I'm sneaking around, you know, and I'm working, trying to be real quiet. And I bend down like this, and they're right below me talking at the speaker. And my tape major come off. Boom! Boom! <laughs> and hit right by the speaker. Well, I could have sat on the curb and swung my feet. And the pastor, he goes, well, I guess I'll introduce you. Terry Wallwerger up there on the scaffold. <laughs> and uh, it kind of made the whole job, because I was over this job by then, a year and a half. And it made the whole job when everybody stood up and started clapping. And they were sincere. They really, this was their new home. And they really appreciated it. Okay, that's when it's all finished. And that's their first day that's going to have church. It's just amazing. They took the baptismal out and put drums back there. They had a <laughs> baptism. But that's a church in Louisville. 
fourth and Breckenridge. And I think that's it. Um, you're welcome to come downstairs. I've got all my stuff set up. There's, if you've got any questions about the corners or anything like that, I got a star foam one, uh, a metal one, and all the way back to how they were originally done. Thank you so much for your time. I hope I helped you. If you've got any questions, please ask me.